Hi, Miss Hernandez here. Hello to my favorite class ever. <laughs> I hope you're all doing super awesome today. I'm feeling pretty good today. Um, had a pretty relaxing morning and now I'm super excited to get into our last chapter of Island of the Blue Dolphins. And even though I'm sad we're finishing up the book, I'm looking forward to starting another novel with you guys. So that's something we have to look forward to. Also, we get to find out what happens at the end of the story. And that's always exciting about finishing a book is getting to that last page. So thank you all for sticking with me through the whole novel. And let's see what happens in this last chapter. Let's get into it. Chapter 29. After two more springs had gone on a morning of white clouds and calm seas, the ship came back. At dawn, I saw it from the headland far out on the horizon. When the sun was overhead, it lay anchored in Coral Cove. Until the sun went down, I watched from the headland while the men made a camp on the shore and built a fire. Then I went to my house. All night I did not sleep, thinking of the man who once had called to me. I had thought of his voice calling for a long time, since the night of the storm when the ship had sailed away. Every day during those two springs and summers, I had gone to the headland and watched, always at dawn and again at dusk. In the morning, I smelled smoke from the fire. I went down to the ravine and bathed in the spring and put on my otter cape and my cormorant skirt. I put on the necklace of black stones and the black earrings. With blue clay, I made the mark of our tribe across my nose. Then I did something that made me smile at myself. I did what my older sister Ulape had done when she left the island of the Blue Dolphins. Below the mark of our tribe, I carefully made the sign which meant that I was still unmarried. I was no longer a girl, yet I made it anyway, using the blue clay and some white clay for the dots. I went back to the house then and built a fire and cooked food for Rantu Aru and me. I was not hungry, and he ate my food and his too. We are going away, I said to him, away from our island. But he only put his head to one side, as his father often had done, and when I said no more, he trotted out to a sunny place and lay down and fell asleep. Now that the white men had come back, I could not think of what I would do when I went across the sea, or make a picture in my mind of the white men and what they did there, or see my people who had been gone so long. Nor thinking of the past, of the many summers and winters and springs that had gone, could I see each of them. They were all one, a tight feeling in my breast, and nothing more. The morning was full of sun, the wind smelled of the sea and the other things that lived in it. I saw the men long before. So I want you to kind of think about what do you think made Karana make the decision to leave the island? Why do you think she so easily trusted these men and decided to leave with them on their ship? Because before, right, she was scared of the Aleuts, she wasn't sure about leaving the island, so why do you think all of a sudden she decided that she's going to leave the island for sure? She saw the house on the headland, far off on the dunes to the south. There were three of them, two tall men and one who was short and wore a long gray robe. They left the dunes and came along the cliff, and then seeing the smoke from the fire which I kept burning, they followed it and at last reached my house. I crawled under the fence and stood facing them. The man in the gray robe had a string of beads around his neck, and at the end of it was an ornament of polished wood. He raised his hand and made a motion toward me, which was the shape of the ornament he wore. Then one of the two men who stood behind him spoke to me. His words made the strangest sounds I've ever heard. At first I wanted to laugh, but I bit my tongue. I shook my head and smiled at him. He spoke again, slowly this time, and though his words sounded the same as before and meant nothing to me, they now seemed sweet. They were the sound of a human voice. There is no sound like this in all the world. The man lifted his hand and pointed toward the cove and made a picture in the air of what could have been a ship. To this I nodded and myself pointed to the three baskets I had placed by the fire, making a gesture of taking them with me to the ship, also the cage in which I had put the two young birds. There were many gestures before we left, though the two men spoke among themselves. They liked my necklace, the cape, and the cormorant skirt that shone in the sun. But when we got to the beach where their camp was, the first thing the man who spoke the most did was to tell the other men to make me a dress. I knew this is what he said because one of them stood in front of me and held up a string from my neck to my feet and across my shoulders. The dress was blue. It was made of two trousers just like those the white men were wearing. The trousers were cut up into pieces 
and then one of the men sat down on a rock and put them together again with white string. He had a long nose, which looked like the needle he used. He sat all afternoon on the rock, and the needle went back and forth, in and out, flashing in the sun. From time to time, he would hold up the dress and nod his head, as if he were pleased. I nodded as if I were pleased, too, but I was not. I wanted to wear my cormorant skirt and my otter cape, which were much more beautiful than the thing he was making. The dress reached from my throat to my feet, and I did not like it, either the color of it or the way it scratched. It was also hot. But I smiled and put my cormorant skirt away in one of the baskets to wear when I got across the sea, sometime when the men were not around. The ship stayed in Coral Cove nine days. It had come for otter, but the otter had gone. Some must have been left. After all, who remembered the Aleuts? For on that morning there were none to be seen. I knew where they had gone. They had gone to Tall Rock, but when the men showed me the weapons they had brought to kill the otter, I shook my head and acted as though I did not understand. They pointed to my otter cape, but I still shook my head. I asked them then about the ship that had taken my people away many years before, making the signs of the ship and pointing to the east, but they did not understand. Not until I came to Mission Santa Barbara and met Father Gonzalez did I learn from him that this ship had sunk in a great storm soon after it reached his country, and that on the whole ocean thereabouts there was no other. For this reason, the white men had not come back for me. On the tenth day we sailed, it was a morning of blue skies and no wind. We went straight toward the sun. For a long t time I stood and looked back at the island of the blue dolphins, the last thing I saw of it was the high headland. I thought of Rontu lying there beneath the stones of many colors, and of Wanani, wherever she was, and the little red fox that would scratch in vain at my fence, and my canoe hidden in the cave, and all of the happy days. So remember we talked about missions? Well, this is the mission of Santa Barbara, and this is where Karana was taken uh, once they got on the ship and started their journey. So this is where they took her back to. When she was taken to the mission, she lived there for some time, but she ended up getting pretty sick and she passed away. Now this is her gravestone that is actually still at the Santa Barbara mission, and the name Juana Maria is on it because this is the name that they gave her when she came to the mission. And it says she was the Indian woman abandoned on an island alone, but they went and got her and brought her back there. So this shows that part of this story is true, right? Because we have real historical evidence. Dolphins rose out of the sea and swam before the ship. They swam for many leagues in the morning through the bright water, weaving through their foamy patterns. The little birds were chirping in their cage, and Rantu Aru sat beside me. Okay, so now that Karana is on this ship and she's journeying with these men, she starts asking them some questions, right? Even though she can't talk to them, she's using gestures because they don't speak the language she speaks. And so she asks them about the ship that her family was on way back in the day when they came and took them. And so she asks them what happened to it. So I want you to tell me on the side and answer the question, what happened to the ship carrying the people from Karana's so Island? So now I'm going to read the author's note. And this is kind of a little extra information about the history behind this story and where the author got his information from. So I think it's important we read it because this is one of those cool stories that has partly true information, right? But the author had to add some stuff to create this long story because little was known about Karana, actually. And so this will be interesting to read the author's note and kind of hear more about the background of this story. Author's note. The island called in this book, The Island of the Blue Dolphins, was first settled by Indians in about 2000 BC, but it was not discovered by white men until 1602. In that year, the Spanish explorer Sebastian Vizcaino set out from Mexico in search of a port where treasure galleons from the Philippines could find shelter in case of distress. Sailing north along the California coast, he sighted the island, sent a small boat ashore, and named it La Isla de San Nicolas, in honor of the patron saints of sailors, travelers, and merchants. As the centuries passed, California changed from Spanish to Mexican hands. The Americans arrived, but only occasional hunters visited the island. Its Indian inhabitants remained in isolation. The girl, Robinson Crusoe, whose story I have attempted to recreate, 
actually lived alone upon this island from 1835 to 1853 and is known to history as the Lost Woman of San Nicolas. The facts about her are few, from the reports of Captain Hubbard, whose schooner carried away the Indians of Galas Ott, we know that the girl did jump into the sea, despite efforts to restrain her. From records left by Captain Nadiver, we know that he found her eighteen years later, alone with a dog in a crude house on the headland, dressed in a skirt of cormorant feathers. Father Gonzalez of Santa Barbara Mission, who befriended her after her rescue, learned that her brother had been killed by wild dogs. He learned little else, for she spoke to him only in signs. Neither he nor the many Indians at the mission could understand her strange language. The Indians of Galas Ott had long since disappeared. The lost woman of San Nicolas is buried on a hill near the Santa Barbara mission. Her skirt of green cormorant feathers was sent to Rome. Outermost of the eight Channel Islands, San Nicolas is about 75 miles southwest of Los Angeles. For years, historians thought it had been settled some six centuries ago, but recent carbon-14 tests of excavations on the island show that Indians came here from the north long before the Christian era. Their images of the creatures of the land, sea, and air, similar to those found on the shores of Alaska and carved with extraordinary skill, may be seen at the Southwest Museum in Los Angeles. The future of San Nicolas is not clear. It is now a secret base of the United States Navy, but scientists predict that because of the pounding waves and furious winds, it will one day be swept back into the sea. In the writing of the Island of the Blue Dolphins, I am deeply indebted to Maud and Delo Lovelace, to Bernice Eastman Johnson of the Southwest Museum, and to Fletcher Carr, formerly curator of the San Diego Museum of Man. Now let's read a little bit more about the author. Scott O'Dell, who was born in Los Angeles in 1898, wrote 26 books for children before his death at the age of 91. Among his many literary rewards were the Newbery Medal for the Island of the Blue Dolphins and the Hans Christian Andersen Medal for his body of work, the highest international award given to an author of children's books. It was not until 1960, 26 years after his first novel for adults was published, that he wrote a book for children. It was Island of the Blue Dolphins, a story that has been translated into 19 different languages and after 30 year years is still read by children around the world. In 1976, the Children's Literature Association named Island of the Blue Dolphins one of the 10 best American children's books of the past 200 years. Okay, so now that we've finished the book, I want to ask you one last question. And I want to know one thing you liked about the book. And I also want to know one thing you would change about the book. So maybe something you didn't like, maybe you didn't like the ending, maybe a character you would change, or maybe some sort of event that happened in the story that you would take out or add something else. So I want to hear your ideas about how you could change the book to make it better to what you like. And so I really enjoyed the book. I hope you did too. And I'm super excited to start our next novel. And thank you for participating and answering all the questions. You guys have been so awesome. Keep up the good work. And keep those smiles on your faces. And keep reading. Read your books at home. There's some free books online that you can find. Maybe your parents can help you find them. I just encourage you to do as much reading as you can, especially during this quarantine because we all have lots of time. Miss Hernandez just started a new book too, and so I encourage you to read as much as possible. But have a good day, and I will see you next time for when we start our next novel.